Have you heard about Industry 4.0 before? Yes. No. So everybody knows already. Okay. Right. This is typical pictures of industrialization. Industrialization. <laughs> so this is the end of 18th century. Steam power. Steam power. So mechanical. Machines, machines re replace the human muscle, human muscle. And in beginning of 20th century, so it's a 1900s or 1910 around. There is a conveyor belt coming from Ford Motors. So they use uh, electrical power to have a uh, mass production. Ford company was very famous at the time. And then early 70s, because computer is created in uh, 60s, 60s. So they started to use computer for industry. So IT, IT to automate production. Automation, automation is coming. Now, we don't know yet, but uh, especially the German is pushing for this new concept of industry 4.0. Cyber physical system, CPS, to monitor, analyze, and automate business. Many people are saying that these two are very similar. So the 3.0 and 4.0 is not so big difference. But also, at the same time, the other people, people are saying this is a big change are undergoing. Same story again, same story. Mechanical weaving and water and steam. Production line, conveyor belt, mass production, electrical. Programmable logic controller, PLC, electronics, IT, automation. Now it's longer, right? Today, cyber physical system, linking real object with information processing. IoT is involved in that. The physical object, physical object, real object, phys physical object. Phys physical object, car, right? With information, processing a virtual object. So there has been a digital twin concept. And processes by uh, information network, internet. All right, this is for uh, agricultural revolution. That is before the first uh, revolution by mechanical. But still, you see that some kind of machine is so planter, harvester, and thresher, that is a mechanical devices, mechanical. Segadora, what is this? Sembradora, Trilladora. It is some kind of, not English, Italian. Can you identify? Well, anyway, once again, planter, planter. Uh, harvester, uh, and also chemical, chemical is coming, and also selective breeding, cattle, selective uh, breeding of cattle, or also selective uh, planting of special uh, kind of crops that gives you booming of uh, large uh, increase of production of mills and crops, right? that gives you uh, big changes into the social world. So in terms of agricultural revolution, what happens? It goes your food surplus. In 
agricultural regions. In, 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 in terms of saying that by doing some automation in agriculture, so we, we don't need to have such a big number of person for the agriculture. So their uh, spare uh, persons, not, not here, right? Anyway, food supply surplus gives you better diet and then better health and also low, lower death rate gives you bigger population. That is one side. The other side is the people is not so, you don't, you don't need such uh, many person, number of persons for making agricultural place because of the machine. So that is another side of, so that there are a uh, surplus of head person that, that they collected into a, or merged into a city. That, that, that gives you a, a starting of cities. <laughs> Cause of the industrial revolution. So after that, after the agricultural uh, revolution, then it gives you first revolution in, in UK. So surplus of population, surplus of population. In cities, there was a population boom in early eight, uh, 19th century because of the agricultural food, surplus, enough food than before, and less need for workers for uh, agriculture. So increase of total number, also less number for uh, field agriculture workers. So extra people turned to goes to into cities, and then they try to start uh, cottage industries, factories, right? Factories. That it is another reason. Another reason. Also, they give, develop a technology too. So this is a book, probably in, uh, how many years? 15 years ago, well, right. near the 21st century, first century, that is a uh, famous book coming from MIT. So there, uh, I'm, I'm summarizing. So which one is bet more important for your living? Right. Food is more important. It, without food, you, you can die. Right? But without car, you can still survive. But which one is expensive? Car is more expensive. Food is indispensable. You, you, you must have a food, minimum food. Also, comparing to car and Picasso, painting by Picasso, which one is more expensive? Which one is more important for your living? Car is less expensive, but is more important for your living. Picasso, you don't need such painting, but still the price is much higher, much higher. So that is gives us differences from old days. Why? Because of the surplus, it needs to change in society. I mentioned in agricultural revolution and also cities and forming surplus of food. Not, you can say not surplus, but more than before. Right? We have enough. And rare resources because of the technology. Agricultural and, and mechanical. And <laughs> this is for uh, probably if you collect all the food, garbage coming from South Korea, I can say that we can feed North Korean people who is starving. Right? That is my estimation. Right? Only from South Korea, garbage, food garbage can be collected if you can collect and then provide to North. You can save the uh, starving children in North Korea. So it is over the world that is same phenomenon. We, we have enough food than be, before and, and 
needy. That is another one, right? But, but, I'm saying for digital uh, words, the food is physical one, physical, not uh, digital, right? So if we share money or food or car or painting, my share can be smaller, right? But digital information, digital information, wording or computer files or Bible or computer contents, so film, video, right? That can be shared without any shortage. Right? So he is saying that if you share the information, information, digital contents, the uh, uh, how can I say the value of that one is increasing every time we share. But in 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 reverse way, the physical one, the food or car. As as many times you share, your share your your own share is decreasing. That is big difference. Big difference for digital world. Digital. If you share, the bell increase. No no limitation. But also it comes with the price fluctuation of stocks or paintings are bigger than food or car. The, the indexes, indexes for, because we don't need a uh, uh, Picasso painting for my living, right? Still high price, but if something happening, right? Something like a war, war is beginning, global war, World War Three, then nobody wants to have uh, keeping the Picasso, right? They need more food than Picasso. That's why. Plus price fluctuation is bigger. So that is typical for uh, uh, digital words now. Okay, once again, the once again, the same picture once again. Right? Uh, mechanical, in early 18th, uh, conveyor belt, but it is not from Ford, it is from uh, Cincinnati slaughter. House, the pig, and then PLC, same, and what is it? Modicon, Modicon, I, can, I don't know, and cyber physical ones. And also the same, John, again. Mechanical, water power, steam power, mechanical, right? Mass production, folds, and assembly line electricity, computer, and automation. All right, turn to the outsourcing. Uh, I'm trying to, at that time, this is early 20th century, 1900 something, or 1910, that Ford created the mass production me method and using conveyor belt and, and electrical power. At that time, T1 car is very famous. Ford uh, produced the T1 type car. Very successful car. And that, the famous car that uh, uh, conveyor belt is started in Rouge factory of Ford. It is located in Detroit. Detroit. Still there. Still there. You can visit there. Yeah. I have been to there three years ago. But I'm saying it's 100, 100 years ago. 100 years ago. Right? 100, 100 years ago. Right. At that time, it was 100,000 people working at one site. The biggest complex at the time in the world. Probably maybe same, you know. I don't know whether there is a bigger factory in China or India, but big, still big, right? But this factory has a steel mill, glass factory too, in the same area. So that every component of car was made in one site. 
one side. So they, they have also have a, a port, port at this factory. So they brought iron core and also raw material for glass. And then they have a starting from making steel plate and, and then components and then that's why it's a big site and also many people are working. But they still now mass production, right? But nowadays they want to have a mass customization. And that gives you outsourcing. And I'm saying that the, at this time there was no outsourcing, no outsourcing. All materials and, and raw materials are, are in sources, in sources at one site. Right? And nowadays, outsourcing. Outsourcing is popular. This is a picture coming from uh, 100 years ago. The steel mill, probably. Conveyors and powerhouse. That's And this is a Ford assembly line. Right? You can see there are so many people working together right? along the conveyor belt. But they are assembling. This is a Korean automatic Hyundai motor line, or final assembly line. There are some people, but probably it is rest time or coffee time, I don't know. But comparing, there are some people along the uh, line, but the numbers you can see that number of people. So how many? The, the the automation automation is already progressed hundred years. Big changes. And also, I want to explain the outsourcing. These many of these parts are stacked over this uh, 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 plastic boxes. We call this is, uh, what is it? Not plate. Uh, <laughs> let me see. And then those uh, uh, boxes are, are uh, containing the components of the car coming from the outside of the factory. Delivered, delivered. And then also this car and this car and this car has different specifications so that they should be having different parts. Say, audio system of these cars are different. So you need to collect the correct box and then corresponding audio system to the correct car. So it should be matching together. Otherwise, you may have a different wrong production. So this is very complicated. You should have a, a barcode checking or something like that. So once again, surplus, surplus, surplus. Uh, the increase of data over the internet it doubles every 100 days. You can think about the Google data center, Google data center, very big, very big. because Every hundred days, their data, Google data, doubles. <laughs> How can they manage those data center? Right? Big problem. Production of food, overproduction, surplus. And then now it goes that because of the food company and also technology development, there is a surplus of cars. And now, we arrive at surplus of information. Too many information in my smartphone. And every time the surplus induces change in society, then what can be the next change because of the surplus of information? We can Why we have this kind of uh, Changes because of this is coming from Korean War, Korea War in 1950. But they are uh, delivering 
I guess it is water or, or milk, something. So that because what because of not enough water or not enough food right? during the war time. So in that case, who is the king? The supplier is the king. Right? Supply is the king. Buyers or customers should make a queue, a long queue, to wait until my uh, turn is coming. That was similar to the Ford Rouge factory 100 years ago. At that time, there was a booming of society trying to have a mica, mica boom, so that every customer is waiting for delivery of T1 car. And Ford is, was the king. Supplier was the king. So they need to only to produce as many same car as possible. That's why they brought a new idea of convertible. Because demand is enough, supply is not enough. But now it changes, surplus. Too many car companies, including Hyundai, right? Hyundai. Also China, there are so many factories to producing cars, right? So nowadays it is over, right? Now we say customer is king, not suppliers, right? Over the hundred years, customer is king. That's why you should have a special production system, personalized production, right? options. Because of the supply, su surplus, surplus, oversupply. Right? So they changed from supplier's king market, changed to buyer's king market now, right? over the 100 years. So customer is king. So they should match their each customer's uh, uh, what is it? The options. Right? Each customer has their own need, right? so they should have a mass customization instead of mass production, or we say that personalized production, personalization. Well, how can we uh, work on this, this AI? Deep learning can work for this personalized production. I see that. And this is coming from a book. And in in uh, first revolution in UK, there has been a craftsman. And then say you can sh make a custom made of your clothes or shoe. shoe. So like a craft production, one by one, right? So one uh, customer, one production. Right? And then goes into Ford company, mass production, convert, and goes into a more computerized mass production. At, at that was uh, uh, around uh, 70 years ago. But because of the oversupply, oversupply from coming from mass production, now is a customer is king, right? So you need to adapt it to the market. Market is king, customer is king. So you customization. More and more now is it goes into personalized production. And it gives you a regionalization of production. Because what? Med, see, I, I only need to produce one item because of one batch size, one batch size. Then you cannot order to the China to to sell in in, in United States, right? cost the, the, the uh, transportation cost is bigger. It's better than to produce inside the United States. Even though the production, the salary is higher, but per one production, one person as a production, it's better to have a local production. That is more economic. That's why. So over time, in same picture, same explanation again, craft production, mass production, mass customization, and now we arrive at personal production. 
the designers, the customers is involved in that. In old days, customer is involved with the craftsman, so they are talking with craftsmen. But in in mass production stage, customer does not involve in that because the supplier was the king. Right? They just want wait for their delivery. Right? So only selling, right? just as it is. But now once again, the customer is involved in the design. This is a new uh, speed factory from Adidas. So it looks like a uh, Saka shoes, Saka shoe, because of this pins. It was craftsmen uh, making in old days, right? Or probably in Indonesia. But also they sell in it looks like a fancy uh, store of Adidas. But the production was done. Uh, I heard that in Indonesia, Indonesia, yeah. and deliver the so mass production and they deliver to here in Germany, probably or in the United States, have a fancy store. But now they are changing. That they brought back, brought back the factory into the Germany, yeah. Adidas, so that the base of the shoe is 3D printed. This is 3D printing. Cushion, everything, and then uh, the sewing. Sewing is done by uh, robot, so that customer can visit the fact the uh, uh, store, and the robot can or other machine can scan my foot. And then 3D printing the base and then sewing by one by one. So it, you can make a personalized product at the site. So it's a big change. But they are saying in Germany, instead of 500 people working in Indonesia, they need only 50 person working in Germany. But they can provide personalized product. So they are also the the store the front store is changed into a robot shop. Looks like a robot shop. Uh, return to the shipbuilding uh, industry or worldwide shipbuilding need. I want to show you that the fluctuation in shipbuilding is very big. This is a five-year-old bulk carrier. So it's old ships, sales price comparing to 76 to 2000 is how many years? 25 years, 25 years duration. And I counted the minimum cost and maximum cost. It is about 70, seven times higher of fluctuations, big change. This is an old tanker, right? same five years. A bulk carrier, this is tanker, oil tanker. Here, also 76 up to 2000. This is 14 time. Very big changes. Right? Comparing to the car industry, this is a used car price index between 95 up to 2000 and also 2013. And I divide into maximum around here and minimum around here. Right? And that was uh, Lehman Brothers, the bubble coming from the United States, right? 2008. But only 1.5 times fluctuation. Right? So shipbuilding is very rough industry. They are saying high risk, high return, high risk, high return, business, especially shipbuilding, also shipping industry too, shipping industry. This is a chart coming from uh, uh, Japan, Japan. Right? That's why there are some Japanese characters. Right? This is tone, tones. 10,000 tons, 
And Oishok, Oishok in 1973, that was uh, coming from war between Israel and Egypt. And that Suez Canal was closed. And oil prices going up four times in one week. Four times. Because Suez Canal is closed, the oil coming from Saudi Arabia and, and other things, they cannot pass through the Europe. The Swiss Canal to the Europe. They need to go around the South Africa. That's why shortage of oil. And then there is another uh, oil shock in '78. That gives you very hard time to uh, old shipbuilding industry. So in 1990. This is for uh, re re reshaping or, or shrinking of uh, shipbuilding uh, dry docks in, in only in Japan. So this is a first shipbuilding facility reduction in, in Japan. This is in Japan. Right? And Plaza, Plaza Agreement, because of that one, the uh, yen, Japanese yen, is rising into doubled because of this in say uh, Reagan President Reagan era uh, because of some problem in the United States anyway or German too but that gives you another hard time for uh, Japan so that they are you know, second shipbuilding facility reduction in 1880 and then this is a uh, IMF of in in Korea, so that we borrow money from IMF. We are, say Asian financial crisis in 1997, and this is coming from United States, right? Also, Japan is a bubble in 1990, bubble crisis in Japan. Only only in Japan. But anyway, this gives you uh, the production in China. And Japan, China, Korea, and Europe. Okay. And share in 2015 is uh, 1973-74. So altogether it is almost uh, money. 70-85% is produced by the same country. This slide is coming from EU. EU. But in, in terms of big shipbuilding company, there is not a few, only few is remaining in EU country. But they uh, collected all uh, industry coming from around ocean, including tourism and oil and gas, offshore oil and gas. This is a big business in Korea and Japan. And shipping too. Shipping too, shipping industry, yachting, and uh, ferry, and tourism too, and fishery too, right? fishery, and waterway transportation, and altogether they are saying this is a good, good growth industry sector. Right? So still, even though big shipyard is not not anymore there, but the ocean industry altogether is good growth in Europe. So you can see this. All right. Yes, sir. Yes, um, I'm going to present uh, and talk a bit about 3D printing, give you a brief introduction to the additive manufacturing. Um, first of all, the agenda. I will start with an uh, overview about 3D printing and all the different kinds of the technologies. Um, then I'm going to talk about the key char characteristics of additive manufacturing. Then I will continue to the process chain of additive manufacturing. And I will be a bit uh, specific about the, the direct metal laser centering. And in the end, I will give you some examples of applications for uh, 3D printing in the industry. So first, the basic overview. Um, 
it's commonly you, uh, called 3D printing, but actually the um, technical term is additive manufacturing. And the definition of the Wohler's report is uh, the process of joining materials to make objects from 3D model data, usually layer upon layer, as obsessed to subjective manufacturing methods, like milling, for example. I like guess the opposite. Instead of subtracting, you're adding material to create a part. And how does it work? So here's the very <coughs> simple, the functional principles. So in the beginning, you have the 3D model, the data set on your computer, send it to the 3D printer, and he will add layer by layer um, on each other until we have, in the end, the uh, finished 3D part. So now to the technologies. So there are various technologies for additive manufacturing, and each technology has its benefits and its downsides. So depending, depending on the application, you should choose wisely which technology you, you want to use. So here's our overview about the uh, additive, additive manufacturing technologies. And I will bri briefly go through every group of uh, these technologies. So first, I will talk about the VAT photopolymerization technologies. Um, basically, you use a liquid. You can see in this picture, like a, a liquid. And then you use a light source or like a laser to um, solid one layer by a layer. And there are three different um, technologies used. First is the stereolithography. There was the first 3D printing technology available. Then there's the the, uh, digi digital light processing. It's similar. Instead, you, uh, instead of losing a laser, you use a protector and uh, project the image of the layer to the um, liquid. And then the continuous digital light processing is a quite new technology. Um, it's, it's, at the moment, it's sold under the name CLIP. It's uh, super fast, and you combine uh, the stereolithography with uh, also um, controlling the air conditions, the CO2 and um, O2 in the machine, and so you can print uh, a lot faster. So the next um, group I'm talking about is the material extrusion. Basically, it's the fused deposition modeling. Um, it's the most common known 3D printing technique, uh, like you can see in the picture. Um, it's like, yeah, like very, very, a lot of private people have one of these printers at home, like me, for example, and use it for, it's very cheap, it's very simple to use, and the principle is you have a plastic filament, you mold the filament in the nozzle, in the hot end, and create your part layer by layer. Um, then to the next topic. Next part, it's the material jetting. It's a bit similar to the fused uh, deposition modeling, only instead you use uh, small droplets. Um, so you use droplets and um, create layers, and then you can use, like for example, with the material jetting, you use light to solve, to to make a solid part. Um, there are some artists, for example, the nanoparticle jetting. You can even use uh, metal, create metal parts with it. So you, um, the droplets contain a binder agent and very, very small metal parts. And then you lose, use heat to evaporate the binder ag uh, agent, and in the end you just have a solid metal part. Or you can also um, create wax um, solids mostly used, for example, for um, molding forms, shapes. Then the next group I'm talking about is the binder jetting, similar to the f uh, previous one. Um, you have a powder, and you add um, a binder, binder agent to the powder and solidify this, uh, the powder. And the uh, most benefit you have is like you can print in colors. So it's uh, mostly used for, for example, it's very popular. You can 3D scan yourself and print a small mini-me of you. There are a lot of stores popping up, uh, quite famous. 
Um, the next group I'm talking about, it's kind of the biggest and most important group. It's the powder bed fusion. So you have um, four different technologies in this, in this group. It's the first is the multi-jet fusion, also quite new. Um, HP invented this technology last year and presented it. Um, basically, it's uh, similar to the binder jetting, only that you add a binder agent and the bind binder agent activates the powder and says like only where pine, uh, binder agent liquids are should be uh, sol um, should be get solid by by adding heat. So then uh, the next one is the selective laser sintering um, used for plastics. Then similar to te uh, technology is the direct metal laser sintering. So you can 3D print metal parts. Um, I will have a lot of most of the examples I have are uh, created by this technology. And similar, there is the electric beam melting. So instead of using a laser, you use electrons. So a much higher, much higher energy to create metal parts. Um, this group, the direct energy deposition, um, a bit different. Instead of having a powder, you um, you put your laser on, you have a material wire who supplies the, the material. You, um, yeah, the electric beam projector or a high power laser beam uh, melts the wire uh, directly on the part you wanna, where you want to create it. And it's um, commonly used for quite big, big 3D printed parts. So, and lastly, it's the sheet lamination kind of very um, used. Um, basically, you can think of it like a normal printer. So you print a page, add color on it. Then you cut the page in the form and glue it to the previous page. And do this until you reach your, your part. So um, now I talked about the uh, different technologies. I will tell you about uh, for what or why you should um, can use uh, additive manufacturing. So the first reason is the freedom of, freedom, freedom of design. So you have like three parts, complex geometries you can um, fulfill. You could use fun functional integration and customization. So for example, for the complex geometries, we're good. So, um, exactly, so complex geometries, you can um, create lightweight structures. So especially for motorsport, aerospace applications, uh, very interesting. You can s save a lot of weight and so a lot of um, energy and fuel and so a lot of money. Um, you can create new and complex designs, which would be impossible with um, traditional manufacturing methods. Like for example, it's a, it's a tool for um, shaping metal sheets and you have uh, integrated in a cooling channel. Um, you can create functional integration parts. For example, this uh, gripper, it's printed in one part. It's, uh, you, you can move it, use it, grip it, but it's printed as one part. So no assembly steps afterwards. Um, customization, like we, we talked before in this, in this slide, is a very important part and gets more and more important. For example, in the dental area, you can c print uh, customized um, specific uh, protestics, or you can customers can create a, or an, their own shape for lamps, for example. Then, and the second um, characteristic of uh, 3D printing or additive manufacturing is the freedom of production. And also, we heard uh, earlier one one point is like going from local to global production so basically you need a 3d printer put it anywhere in the world send your files per email to the guy and he can print this exactly the same part without any knowledge specific knowledge you you only need a very small fabric and can create every part you want um, also very 
important you can have small and ec economic production. Like when you think, for example, about melding, uh, you need the, sh the shape for it, so it's very expensive to create it. So you need a lot of parts that uh, one single part is getting cheap. Uh, for 3D printing, every every part is the same price. Doesn't matter, nearly doesn't matter how many you pr uh, produce. Um, you can create different parts at once. Like, uh, Similarized with, for example, you have the circle part, but at the same time, you can also print the circle and the triangle part, or or like a three fourth circle part. Doesn't matter, as long as it fits on the platform and in the 3D printer. And um, you can save a lot of place. Like you don't need any bare warehouses. Um, if you can from just in time on demand. So when a customer needs a, needs a replacement part, you say, sure, let me print it. You have it tomorrow. Instead of uh, I have to check in the warehouse and order it, order it if it's not there. So on uh, the next slide. We talked about why you can use it, and now um, here's about where you can use it. So basically, there are three different spots in the traditional manufacturing model. So first, you can um, create an additive manufacturing part first, and afterwards you use traditional manufacturing methods. For example, when you use a very tight uh, tolerances, for example, you can still miling or use a CNC. You can uh, replace uh, traditional um, manufacturing models, or you can do it the other way around. First, you create a part, and then add uh, additif additive manufacturing. As for example, um, uh, for repair, for repairs, when when think about the propeller, uh, a piece of the propeller is broken, so you can go uh, to a 3D printer and. Um, repair the part by 3D scanning and remodeling it. Um, so, have integrated technologies in the new product chains by instead of CNC. So, you, when you want to add the value of, uh, like you saw in the previous slide, like efficiency, design, or flexibility, or you can um, improve your current design by first 3D print the part and then uh, go to the CNC. So now I'm going to talk a bit about the process chain, especially for the DMLS technology. So first we start with the uh, design, with the 3D modeling. So you create, uh, like everybody of you did before, I guess, you create a 3D model you want to um, print. But of course, you first you consider your technology you want to use, like I said, uh, before, like every technology has benefits and limitations. So usually when you're into this, you know how and what you have to um, take care for. Then when you have your 3D model, you have to export your 3D model in the stereolithography file, STL, short, everybody using STL. Um, that's a very important step. So as you see, the resolution is uh, very important. You can have a low resolution and a small memory space for this part, so it's quite efficient to to handle it. Um, but also, like the triangulation is very bad. So when you have a complex uh, geometry, you you're more likely to go like for a high fine fine resolution like this. But then you also like create huge, really huge uh, files. Like I, when you yeah, let's say you have a kind of complex part in this size. Uh, I also had like a STL part of uh, three gigabytes and it's huge to handle, takes ages on your PC. Um, so you have to find a trade-off be between uh, high, f high fine resolution and uh, like low memory space used. When you have your STL export, you go to the slicing. So the slicing um, is literally that what you saw in the 3D printer, like layer by layer. Um, 3D printer creates 3D models, but he thinks in 2D. So he has to have 2D data, and it's what the slicing does. Um, 
in the slicing process you add like parameters like temperature, speed of the printing, um, yeah, what material it is, and, and so on. And with all this data, you go to the 3D printer and go to the third step, the building. Okay, ah, here's a short animation how the slicing process works. So you have uh, this contour, this, uh, this shape, and then you slice it. So you can see it's not the original shape. So um, the more slices you have, the more detail you can gain. But also the data is going to be um, higher. And the print uh, takes much longer when, when you can imagine. Like when you've doubled, doubled the number of slices, it probably takes double the time. So you also have to find a trade-off. Or mainly when you can say, like for example, this is a straight line. You can have a huge bigger slices, and when it's got in curves, you need more detail. You can have uh, smaller slices. It's uh, all kind of stuff you have to think about when you prepare for 3D printing. So and now I have a video of the 3D printing process. So this is uh, the newest uh, DMLS printer, the M404 from EOS. Um, it's the first printer with four lasers, so it's much faster than the previous um, previous uh, 3D printers. So, and as you can see, like it's uh, titanium, and uh, the laser literally molds the layers onto each other. And even it's four lasers, like every every layer takes quite a long time, so it's like almost two minutes. And uh, when you imagine it's like um, 20 centimeters high with a resolution of 10 mu, so uh, 2,000 slice uh, layers at least, 2,000 times uh, three minutes uh, takes quite a long time and also it's quite expensive. So you have to be careful what you print and be sure that it will, uh, yeah, will work. So the first one is like the contour, the outer line. It's much faster. So it starts like uh, with a white um, laser, not so nicely surfaces for the inside, and then a small focus one for the contours to have a nice uh, surface. And over so, and now it would continue like adding a new, new uh, layer of powder and doing the same step again over and over until the part is finished. So and the last step is the post processing. Literally consists about the thermal treatments. So like um, the like you saw the building process is basically melting. Um, the powder to each other, so a lot of thermal stresses um, like occur, and so to the stress reduction you need the thermal treatments, and afterwards mechanical treatments for nice, um, nice surfaces and so on, tolerances. So um, after, you, after the uh, treatment and you cut off the, pla the building plate, you can usually you blast the part to get rid of all stuff or bake to it uh, powder which shouldn't be there. And also there you have a lot of different uh, possibilities. So like you can see there was the part after the heat treatment and um, depending on which kind of uh, material you use for this, for the blasting, you get different kinds of surfaces. And this is the milling part, like I said earlier, when you need tight tolerances you usually go further to the CNC step and and create this from this rough kind of rough surface to a um, yeah CNC f surface also roundness is much more accurate with the traditional manufacturing methods than with uh, additive manufacturing 
And now, in the end, I'm going to the examples of applications. So this is a quite famous one. GE was one of the one of the big companies who invested a lot in 3D printing quite early. So that's the most famous part they have. It's a, <coughs> a fuel nozzle, you can see here. So what they did, they managed it to redesign 20 parts into one. So they saved a lot of uh, assembly parts, a lot of tolerances. Um, in the end, the part performance is five times stronger. Um, the fi five times fewer any arrows, and also they could save a lot of fuel by this new nozzle. And in the end, this um, investment brought a lot of um, customers to buy their new engine. So overall, maybe it, it took six years to develop this nozzle. It was a was a huge investment, but in the end, it, it paid paid it off. Um, also. This is a co design concept, very simple. Um, when you go for airplane seat buckle, so nobody think about why should I redesign a seat buckle. It's uh, totally simple, but you can, by using 3D printing, you can reduce the weight of a seat buckle from usually from 155 grams to around 70 grams. And when you add this up for one plane, it's around over 70 kilograms. And when you calculate this over the lifetime of an airplane, you can save a lot of fuel and so a lot, uh, quite a lot of money. So it's also totally worth the investment. Um, another example is uh, this hydraulic block for the Formula One race cars. Uh, also basically used um, for um, weight reduction, so very important for them for high speed and so on. Um, there are some specific tools, FEM tools, to cr to create automatically um, your 3D parts by stress analysis. So it's quite uh, very f common used uh, for 3D printing, because like this form is impossible to create with, or almost impossible to create with tra traditional manufacturing methods. Um, and it's also quite a nice example for traditional, like this plate would be a waste of time and money to 3D print it. So you can just cut out with CNC this plate and on the top you can add the, the hydraulic block. So combine these two methods. Um, this is also quite recent. Um, it's a heat exchange exchanger, so you can have a huge surface in a quite small um, volume. Um, there are also a lot of uh, car manufacturers invest a lot of money, so and it's also 3D printed on a EOS machine. Yeah, it should be aluminium. They're also like impossible to create with traditional manufacturing. And yeah, it was from my side. So uh, any questions? Else? Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Maybe if someone interested, uh, the prices. Uh, it's in German, but uh, like uh, usually you pay between. Yeah, 50 cent for for plastic parts and five euros for metal parts per uh, cube centimeter for 3D printing. For traditional manufacturing and for additive manufacturing, it's uh, 300 euros. For example, the one I showed you in the video, and 75 for plastic 3D printers. So it's much more expensive, but when you go through the additional stuff you can add to your product, it's uh, worth it. Yeah. So. Uh, hello, I'm Hugo Lim and today's first topic is robotics in shipbuilding. Um, the, in the introduction of robotics into shipbuilding process is hindered by a number of factors and 
to solve those vectors, there are some requirements. So today's topic is vectors and the requirements to introduce the robotics into shipbuilding fields. Anyone has any idea? Yeah, that's one of the factors because not like other manufacturing processes, ship is really big to build by robots. So, okay, and no one. If there's no one, I will just move on to the second topic. And for, thi for this topic, um, hindering factors are like this. Because shipbuilding, you know, there's no many same ships, so there are many non-standard parts. And heavy and complex geometries is one of the factors. To do that, we can use more intelligent and flexible control and real-time object detection algorithms with data will be also help to increase the robotics. The second topic is autopilot system. Uh, autopilot system is one of the most advanced tools on ships and modern autopilot systems are capable of being synchronized with the electronic charge system enabling to follow the courses laid out with in the voyage plan. So we don't have to manually change the courses and though we can still stick to the voyage plan. So do you agree or disagree of using this modern autopilot system only without human pilots? Depends on how intelligent these features are. Like if they're stupidly just follow the path, for example, when another ship appears on the path, or there's a storm, or any elf reason to to take another course and navigate, um, it should be yeah, there should be some people around to to yeah, like say if it's the right path or not to take actions. If that's true. This system is not really a um, perfect system yet, so if... you say what route he has to do, and then that's the route, or what do you mean with that? Say it outside of the voyage plan. Is it a predetermined route? Basically, the the most basic part of voyage plan is where where we want to go. But if there is some changeable things, we can change the voyage intelligently. I mean, automatically by this system. Yes, that's true. So, so I think it's similar opinion with him. So how intelligent and how safe is the most important criteria. But 
still now it's not really that safe for autopilot system in ships so um, it, it would be better to use it as an assistance but if we develop it more safely then we can use it only without human pilots Thank you. Uh, I, I guess that command car is more difficult than command ship. Right? So we already have a technology, command car.